All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Cassie Lamb. I am the brand new programs and events director for Eat Denver. Um, so this is my first big event, very excited to be here. And I am more excited to introduce Brad Allen Rubendale. He is the CEO of So All May Eat, Same Cafe, a food justice nonprofit that serves everyone healthy and delicious food regardless of ability to pay. Brad has many years of experience working to deliver quality programs to under-resourced people. His history includes Urban Peak, a nonprofit which addresses youth homelessness, CASA, court-appointed special advocates, a program to advocate for children in foster care, testifying at the Colorado Capitol on behalf of foster children and LGBTQ youth, and being a youth pastor. He also has a few degrees, but the most important education he ever receives is when he shuts up and listens to other people's experiences. Please join me in welcoming Brad for his speech, Lead From Your Fucked Up Soul. I'm Brad Rubendale, I'm the CEO of So All May Eat, Same Cafe, and it's been around for 17 years, um, and the Berkeys, Brad and Libby Berkey are actually in the audience over here, the founders of Same Cafe. And so they had this beautiful idea 17 years ago and started this nonprofit restaurant that everyone kind of thought was crazy and that maybe it would last for six months. We've been going for 17 years and we've actually inspired about five dozen other restaurants around the country to try a pay what you can model. And some of them have been successful, some have not. Um, but the cool part is, is that I took over about six years ago and was able to grow the organization. And as of four months ago, we have our second location in Toledo, Ohio, um, of all places. We'll talk about libraries if you want to, but we're in the library system there and that's how I want to grow us. Um, but anyway, it's a beautiful space and um, thank you. Does this work? Testing, testing. There we go. I can't be tied to one spot. I have to move too much. So um, if you haven't heard of Same, how many have been to Same Cafe? Raise your hand. Awesome. Amazing. Um, so if Same Cafe is a place where you can come in and order off of a menu that changes every single day based on what's in season and in stock. And then it also, um, you can participate how you want. It's a participation-based restaurant where people can volunteer in exchange for a meal. They can pay what they can or donate produce in exchange for a meal. Um, any luck on the slides? Is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. So, here we go. Um, I love what I'm doing, but that's not why I'm here to talk to you. I'm actually, the title of my talk is Lead From Your Fucked Up Soul, if you didn't notice that already. And so, all of what I just said is part of what, how I start every talk that I do. Um, and none of that is false, but I want to give you a little bit of an insight into what goes on inside this chaotic mind and kind of how that has led me to where I am now. So I am gonna just give a quick trigger warning. We're gonna talk about childhood sexual trauma and suicidality this morning. And I know that's early on a Wednesday morning to talk about these things, but here we go. So if you need to leave or get your therapist on speed dial, get it going. So when I was 25 years old, my whole world fell apart. I actually was in grad school and was really thriving. And my world fell apart because I was dating this woman. Yes, I dated a woman. Um, <laughs> I used to wear ill-fitting clothes and have a drawl, so I, I sort of passed as straight, which was fun. Um, but I was dating this woman who was in uh, school to be a therapist, and she casually mentioned one time, she was in a, her trauma class, and kind of mentioned some of the adult effects of children who've experienced trauma. And I fit perfectly, and it kind of, my body started reacting, and it was the craziest thing. So I went and found the the nearest bathroom on campus, curled up in a ball for about 45 minutes and sobbed. And my body was having all of these intense reactions and I didn't fully understand. But thankfully I had a therapist who I could call and it started a three year process of having PTSD where I went back and revisited all of my childhood traumas, learned how to be kind to myself and understand where those traumas come from and learn how to rescue the little children inside of me who had been abused to be able to become an integrated person as much as I am, I don't know, not very, but, <laughs> but it's functional. So I was not always this aged out gay with a massive forehead. I used to be this tiny little gay with a massive forehead. And it, I didn't know that I was gay at first, and I'll get into that. So it took me about 20 years to figure that out. So when I was six months old, 
I used to love playing in the bathtub, and I would like splash and have a lot of fun. And one time I was in there, and I splashed and hit a hot light bulb, and it exploded and burned me over 13 parts of my body. And I learned fear at that moment. It triggered my body and brain into understanding the world is unsafe, and I need to be hypervigilant at all times because something is going to come out of the woodwork. I didn't have the language for that at the time, obviously, but that was what happened. When I was three years old, an older boy started molesting me. And when this happened, the crazy thing about being this age and having a friend, an older friend, molest you, is that there's a lot of grooming that happened. So I didn't understand that it was bad. He was just my friend who wanted to do things that made me really deeply uncomfortable, and I didn't know how to process that. And when I tried to speak about it and stop it, he said, shh, it's our secret, don't say anything. And then when I tried to tell my family and my friends and other people about it, I didn't have the language to communicate it. And so no one saved me from that. And so what I learned was silence in that moment. Turn off everything, stop reacting, don't trust your body. When I was six years old, this is, so I was raised in a cult, so a little side note. Um, we're not gonna talk about the cult. Give me a beer and we'll do that. Um, but I used to sleep with my Bible. It was my comfort. I was a fucked up little kid. And so I would sleep with my Bible and it was like my comfort. And I found out that there were kids in other countries that didn't have Bibles and it broke my heart. So I started this little club where I would figure out where to get Bibles in their language, where to find their addresses. And then I went and asked every adult I knew for a dollar because a dollar could get me to send a Bible. And I started this little club and I was like the president and dictator of the club and I was having a blast with it. And one day I walked into the little meeting that we had and all of my friends had been talking about me and they said, we're kicking you out of the club. We don't want you to be president anymore. I didn't know why, but I shut off. And what I learned was to hide all of my strengths in those moments because it looked like that they could see something that I couldn't see and I didn't know what it was. So I just kind of shut down and hid. When I was eight years old, I had a traumatic sexual violation where three older boys molested me. And that one was one that I didn't want and was no part of, like it was, it was a violent one. And I tried to fight back, but I was too little because they were all older than me. And so um, I will never forget the rage that came up in me in that moment. And it was rage at them, but it was also rage at myself for being so weak to let this happen. And so that rage turned in on me and I lived with all of this intense emotionality for a long time. See, I told you, ill-fitting clothes. So, <laughs> so then whenever I was about 17 years old, we got kicked out of the cult. And what I did is I took all of that experience from my childhood, I put it in a box, and I hid it away and pretended it never happened. And so I jumped into, I knew I was fucked up inside, and so I didn't know what to do with that. And I just assumed it was because I was gay. So I started 13 years of conversion therapy to try to fix my own sexuality, <laughs> analyze every single thing about me to be able to fix it uh, and move forward. That led me to a moment where um, I decided to kill myself. And for a lot of queer um, religious kids, that's where you end up because there's no way out except for a death. And my life died, but I stayed alive, thankfully. And I was gonna make it look like an accident because I didn't want anyone else to know that I was gonna do that because I didn't want them to have permission to do it. It was me that was the only one that was going to get to do it. So right before I was going to do this, I had the world, the darkness in my brain opened up just a little bit. And this phrase, Brad, you are not toxic, dropped into my soul, took root, and like spread throughout every part of me. And for whatever reason, I knew I was going to stay alive, but I was going to be gay and figure that side of it out. It was going to be messy as hell, and it has been. Um, but I knew that I was going to stay alive. And so that was one of those beautiful moments when I got to figure out what is all of this chaos inside and how does that relate to where I'm at now? And that's what I want to talk to you about. So this is what's crazy, is that each one of these moments from my childhood that I learned has become the strength that leads my leadership now, that guides my leadership now. And so the fear that I had was like, here's the thing, nothing can sneak up on me because I'm always looking out for something bad going on. It's hypervigilance. And so that's become the radar where I'm scanning the horizon constantly, and I'm usually making a mitigation plan for every possible eventuality that could go wrong. And so it's become my radar, and now as a leader, very, very few things could surprise me at this point because I've probably thought about it and I've probably made a plan for it. It's one of my superpowers. 
The silence, it was so amazing to work through all of the deep trauma of that being silenced because I found my voice and I found out where my body starts and stops and where other people's does. And I learned about consent, which is amazing. And I, I learned about like how to be able to speak up when I feel uncomfortable, even if I don't know why I feel uncomfortable. How do I speak up and be able to do that? And it's become boundaries. And for me, boundaries are really important, especially when you're a people-helping profession, because everyone's going to ask for everything, and you have to figure out where you start and stop and where other people start and stop. And so it's been this beautiful thing where I probably have too good of boundaries now. My husband will be like, you're a dick. And I'm like, that sounds like a you problem. Let me know when you sort that out. <laughs> I'm just being me. You do this. And so um, it's become really good boundaries, mostly, I think, um, to be able to guide the organization that I'm in. And this one was an interesting one. That hiding, what's crazy is I was a little six-year-old CEO, right? Like I was like, had a mission. I gathered people to do that mission. I fundraised towards that and then I operationalized it. That's what I do every single day right now. But it got shut down because someone else told me that I shouldn't be doing that. And so now I lead from a place of vulnerability because here I am, I'm doing the things that I was doing at six years old and fuck all the way off, I'm gonna do it because I can do that from a place of vulnerability. And now the reality is, is that um, being in a leadership position will bring up every trauma you've ever had. <laughs> and so you have to be exposed because whatever happens in your organization is your fault if it's bad. And if it's good, it's usually your team. And that's just the way it is. And so exactly, my team is all right here, by the way. Hi. <laughs> and so the beautiful thing is, is now I can lead from a place of vulnerability. This one's my favorite one, though. That rage that I had when I was eight years old has become the power that guides me throughout my life. It's the injustice of not being able to fight back and then realizing that everyone has experienced a version of that powerlessness when people have experienced racial injustice and racism, when people have experienced transphobia and homophobia and misogyny and all of that stuff. It's a system that's keeping someone in place. And now that is my power to like fight that on a daily basis, starting with food justice and expanding throughout the rest of the world, hopefully. And I get to create spaces where other people can thrive, not just cisgendered white men that are mediocre like me. <laughs> so the title of my talk is Lead From Your Fucked Up Soul. And here's what I wanna say is, every single person in here has had something that's tried to silence you, kill you, shut you down, stop you, make you less effective, but you're still here. And you're sitting right here in these chairs, which means that you're stronger than whatever that thing is. And that is your superpower. Lean into it. When you feel fucked up, lean into it and see what it has to teach you. Thank you.